It's good to see that when Juan Gonzalez is in residence, uh, Puerto Rico is in residence, and New York is in residence at the King Juan Carlos, so welcome. Um, as everybody's sitting down, uh, I'm just going to make a couple of remarks and introduce Juan, who will introduce the panel. Bienvenidos, welcome. My name is Ana Lopico. I'm the director of the King Juan Carlos I of Spain Center, a very royal name um, for a, a royal uh, panel, I think. Um, the center was established almost 20 years ago for the promotion of Spanish and Hispanic culture. Uh, and in 2001, a cathedra, a chair, was devoted uh, to Latin American civilization and culture, named after the great philologist and statesman and man of letters, Andres Bello, Venezuelan. Um, and as the first Latina director of the center, it gives me enormous pleasure to convoke this event uh, and welcome Juan Gonzalez, who is the first Latino to hold the Andres Bello chair in Latin American culture and civilization, and the first Puerto Rican to hold the first the, the Andres Bello chair. Um, and I think that in itself deserves applause. <laughs> he is also the first journalist um, who holds uh, to hold the chair um, as part of a, a shift in direction uh, for the for the for the visiting professors. We devoted this year and next to journalism, reporting, and public intellectual practices. And so he inaugurates a series, con uh, broche de oro, as they say, with, with, with a golden leaf, right? Um, I want to thank people who have made this possible first, and then I'll introduce Juan. The first person I want to thank is Arlene Davila, Professor Arlene Davila, known to many of you, who made this possible, who nominated Juan and uh, coerced him into applying <laughs> to, become a, uh, to be nominated. Uh, and I want to really thank her for always being a, a pioneer and a, a mover of Latino culture. Um, I want to thank Laura Duregano, who's sitting here at the front, uh, who many of you met at the door, who's the associate director of the center uh, and uh, knows its history uh, and is a repository of its mission. I want to thank Jill Lane, the director of the Center of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, who's seating, seated over there. Next to her is um, Omar Dawahare, who was a, one of the staff at the, at the center. Um, the center is where Juan is teaching um, his course on Latinos, uh, journalism, and reporting in the United States. And you'll hear more about that as the semester goes on. Um, so I'm so happy to, to have you here. And I particularly want to thank the man that you met at the door, Luis Perez, <laughs> who is a, a sentinel and uh, someone who helps to make everything happen here. Um, this semester is a semester um, where the center is occupied um, by Latinos, uh, Puerto Ricanos, by Cuban, <laughs> a little bit, Cuban-American. Um, and Juan has planned an extraordinary series uh, of lectures and discussions, beginning with his lecture on the Puerto Rican debt crisis, a panel on the history of Latino studies, a conversation uh, about Latino artists and their community uh, with Lin Manuel Miranda and Sonia Manzano. And on October 23rd, the center will be hosting an exhibition of six Puerto Rican photographers from the Bronx, the Seis del Sur group, who will be showing more recent work chronicling the figures, the force and vulnerability uh, of Latino community in New York and the Caribbean. So I hope you will come back to, to the center through the, through the fall. My duty and my pleasure to introduce Juan Gonzalez. Um, many of you have been called here. Uh, because of Juan and because of his presence. Um, for more than 35 years, um, Juan has been one of the nation's best known Latino journalists, but for many of us, he's, he's a pioneer uh, of spirit as well. Um, someone whose history is connected to the history of progressive and activist causes, to, to changing our communities, and to a, a long engagement uh, and knowledge of institutions and the, the fourth estate. Uh, and the deep difficulties and promise uh, of those engagements. Um, Juan began as a staff, uh, as, a, as a writer for the New York Daily News, uh, and he's been there since 1987. He's now a columnist who still writes uh, some of the most pregnant and poignant and important interventions uh, in the press on Latino subjects and subject of the United States. He's co-host for the past 18, um, 
it says 18 years. <laughs> I don't think it's 18 years. He's co-host of Democracy Now. 18 years? No. It, it'll be 20 in February. 20? Oh, oh my god, yeah. it is 18 years. OK. Yeah. Um, uh, which, which has transformed how Latinos are also covered right, in the, in the progressive uh, press. Uh, he's an investigative reporter uh, on urban affairs. He has written about the labor movement, the environment, race relations, and political troubles in Latin America. And he's won widespread recognition, including two George Polk Awards for commentary and a 2004 Leadership Award from the National Hispanic Heritage Foundation. He's also one of the founders of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. When I first taught Latino studies at NYU, I taught Harvest of Empire as the first book that any of my students read. And it continues to be in its, is it fourth edition? I don't know what edition it's in. Uh, an extraordinary resource uh, for uh, scholars and students. Um, first published 15 years ago. Uh, it's just a, a blockbuster of a course and uh, became the subject of a documentary feature. If you don't know it, look it up. Um, among his other th books are News for All the People, which he authored with Joseph Torres, which is an amazing book. And Juan is teaching some of the content uh, in, his, in his course at Clax at NYU. Um, a History of Latinos uh, and the Epic Story, as, as the subtitle goes, of Race and the American Media. He's also the author of Roll Down Your Window, Stories from a Forgotten America, and Fallout, The Environmental Consequences of the World Trade Center Collapse. He's currently completing a study of the new populist movements um, that have come to power uh, in major American cities. Juan, of course, uh, is a native son of this, of this city and uh, has lived its history uh, deeply. And uh, I can't think of anyone uh, I'm prouder to welcome here um, to, this, to this center and to welcome you to this evening. Juan Gonzalez. Uh, well, thank you to Anna, and uh, good evening to everyone. And I want to especially thank uh, uh, Lauda and Jill and all of the people here at NYU who really made me feel welcome uh, to come uh, this semester to, uh, to handle the Andres Bello chair and to try to bring some, uh, uh, some new perspectives in terms of uh, scholarship, uh, discussion, debate, and, and inquiry. Uh, to the NYU community. Uh, the young lords, uh, they told me I could pick whatever topics I wanted to pick for these different <laughs> conversations. So I figured, what the heck? Let me, what, maybe, we should do, maybe we should do one on the young lords. Because uh, over 20 years ago, I actually started trying to do, uh, 25 years ago, when I first came back to New York City uh, to work at the Daily News, I started to work on a my, my own perspective or viewpoint on the Young Lords and, and uh, did actually write uh, some stuff but gave it up because I just felt it, I was too close to it uh, and it, uh, the, emotion, the uh, emotions were too raw still and my understanding of what had happened and that I ne it needed more time uh, to develop and probably other scholars or others to come along and, and do the work themselves. Uh, uh, rather than me attempt it, so I went off into other uh, uh, other things. And I haven't really done much in terms of the Lord specifically, uh, in terms of a, any time, attempt at systemic inquiry into what actually happened. So I'm hoping that tonight's discussion will help that along. And I think we've got a great uh, panel, and I'm just gonna try to facilitate the panel uh, between the scholars and the activists. Uh, and, uh, but activists who also uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about what they were involved in as well. And uh, we've had an enormous resurgence of interest uh, in the uh, young lords and in that period of time in the Latino community in recent years. Just to name a few examples, uh, Sonia Songhali's book, uh, Building a Latino Civil Rights Movement, delves uh, uh, in, in several areas into the young lords and their involvement in the Puerto Rican community. Uh, Lilia Fernandez's book that came out last year, Brown in the Windy City, has an entire chapter dealing with the Chicago young lords. 
Uh, we have, uh, of course, Daryl Wanser Serrano, who's with us, who's on his second book on the Young Lords. His first was a source book of documents and speeches and readings on the Young Lords. And this year, he came out with his, uh, his uh, new book on the Young Lords. And uh, Johanna Fernandez, who's been working forever <laughs> on uh, her study uh, of the Young Lords, and will, which will be issued by Princeton University Press next year. So there's a, all, a whole body of scholars who have come in recent years that felt it necessary and they felt it worthwhile to delve into what actually happened with this organization and with the movement around it. And I want to thank all of them for devoting so many hours uh, to their research and their analysis of what happened. And maybe they can help those of us who were involved figure out exactly what went right and what went wrong uh, in this endeavor. So anyway, the panel that we have tonight, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're going to do it. Uh, we're, I'm going to introduce them, going to toss them some questions. We're going to go back and forth and have a discussion for a while. Then we're going to open it up to the audience uh, for your questions. And I want to emphasize questions, uh, uh, not <laughs> presentations, uh, uh, so that we can get as much of a dialogue going uh, as we can. And then we're going to end and we're going to have a reception where we can all like mingle informally and continue whatever arguments or debates were not, uh, were not resolved uh, in the formal discussion. Okay, so to introduce the panel, uh, I want to start with Daryl, who is here to my, to my immediate left. Daryl Wanzer Serrano is an assistant professor of rhetoric and public advocacy in the Department of Communication Studies. Uh, at the University of Iowa, and he's a founding member of the university's Latina, Latino Studies Minor Advisory Board. His research is focused on the intersections of race, ethnicity, and public discourse, particularly as they relate to the formations of coloniality and decoloniality in the United States and within Latino, Latina contexts. His first book, The Young Lords, a Reader, was published by NYU Press. Is, uh, is, has been well received, has cri uh, is critical edition of primary sources, including speeches, newspaper articles, drawings, images, and more. His latest book, The New York Young Lords and the Struggle for Liberation, was published earlier this year by Temple University Press. Uh, Andres Torres uh, wrote of the book, it's a thoroughly documented history of an iconic organization of the Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, and. Um, uh, Daryl Wanzer Serrano Scholarship has also appeared in the top journals in communication studies, edited books, and in various public forums. He's currently working on a new book project tentatively titled Possession, Crafting Americanity in Congressional Debates over Puerto Rico, which examines the formation of coloniality and the rhetoric of Americanity within the first 20 years of U.S. entanglement with Puerto Rico. Uh, to Daryl's left is uh, Iris Morales, <laughs> and uh, many of you know Iris. She was uh, she joined the Young Lords in 1969 and was a member until 1975. She served as Deputy Minister of Education, leader of the Women's Union, and co-leader of the Philadelphia branch of the Young Lords. She has written articles about the Young Lords and is the producer director of Palante, Siempre Palante, broadcast in P on PBS in 1996. For over 40 years, Iris has been an educator, organizer for social justice, and activist for the decolonization of Puerto Rico. From her start as a teacher in non-traditional venues, she organized with other educators and parents to fight for public school reform. She co-founded an organization that trained hundreds of young Latinos and African Americans in television production and joined advocacy groups to fight media stereotypes. She's taught classes on Puerto Rican history and art activism, organized film festivals, and recently helped launch a community media center in East Harlem. Uh, for 13 years prior to that, Iris worked with emerging social justice groups in New York City on issues of homelessness, HIV, AIDS, immigration, women's rights, prison reform, climate justice, and community arts. Uh, she's currently the founder and executive director of the Red Sugarcane Press and is working on a book about the experiences of women in the Young Lords, and she also continues to teach high school and college students. She's a graduate of New York uh, 
Law School, where she was a Ruth Tilden Scholar, the first Puerto Rican to receive this prestigious fellowship, and worked as a television and labor attorney for 12 years. She, she earned her MFA in Integrated Media Arts from Hunter College in 2008. And next to Iris is uh, Mickey um, Miguel, Mickey Melendez. Uh, he was the first generation Cuban Puerto Rican uh, and um, was the, really the person who brought the original Young Lord leadership together uh, and, uh, and uh, really got us to meet each other first because we all knew Mickey, but we didn't necessarily know each other. Uh, and uh, for more than 30 years, he's been the co producer of Con Sabor Latino on WBAI, a, a music and social issues show uh, which can still be heard on 99.5 FM every Sunday from 3 to 6 p.m. He's a founding student of the State University at Old Westbury where he earned his bachelor's degree and he's received his master's from in public administration at Baruch College. He's been a, he's a Repson Fellow uh, at Columbia and has uh, worked in many executive positions in city government in several city government agencies uh, and he's the author of we took the streets fighting for latino rights with the young lords his is the only chronicle yet produced and i emphasize yet uh, by former members of the young lords uh, of their own experiences uh, in uh, that organization and finally johanna fernandez uh, who is an assistant professor at, uh, uh, in history at Baruch College. She's a former Fulbright scholar to Jordan in the Middle East. She's written numerous articles on activism, politics, and gender dynamics of the young lords that have been published in, uh, uh, in anthologies of the 60s movement. Her young lords article in Freedom North, Black uh, Freedom Struggles Outside of the South, and her article on Denise Oliver and the Women of the Young Lords in We Want to Start a Revolution, Radical Women in the Black Freedom Struggle, are cited as groundbreaking texts that have changed the way historians understand the civil rights movement and black power era. Her forthcoming book is titled When the World Was Their Stage, A History of the Young Lords Party from 1969 to 1976. As I said, it will be published by Princeton University Press uh, next year. Professor Fernandez also helped develop the exhibition project Presente, the Young Lords in New York, alongside of art historian Yasmin Ramirez. The project has been reviewed by all, uh, the New York Times and numerous other publications and NPR, and it's, uh, it's still showing at the uh, Bronx Museum of the Arts at Museo del Barrio and the Loisaida Center through about the beginning of October uh, at all of those different venues. And if you haven't seen it, any of them, because uh, they're all different, uh, uh, urge you to, to do, do so. Uh, Johanna is an activist scholar known for her work in the movement to free Mumia Abu Jamal. She is editor of Writing on the Wall, Selected Prison Writings of Mumia Abu Jamal, and with Mumia, she, she is co-editor of a special issue of the journal Socialism and Democracy, titled The Roots of Mass Incarceration in the U.S., Locking Up Black Dissidents and Punishing the Poor. She's also the writer and producer of the film Justice on Trial, the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. She received her Ph.D. Uh, in history at Columbia University under the direction of the late Manning Marable. Uh, so uh, that's the panel. It's a pretty heavy-duty lineup, uh, and uh, I'm going to begin the questions and sit down and join the conversation. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to tell us what drew you <laughs> to the Young Lords, whether to write about them or study them or to be a member and participate. Uh, what was it in your own life that drew you uh, to that involvement and why? And we can start with uh, Johanna. Wow. I've been living with the Young Lords for a very long time. Um, but of course, not as long as those who lived through that period. I learned about the Young Lords when I was a junior in college. I was an undergraduate at Brown University. And uh, Latino studies was a new kid on the block. Uh, my professor was Suzanne Obler. 
And Suzanne Obler, Dr. Suzanne Obler, insisted that I become her research assistant. And she says, you have to learn about the Young Lords. I grew up in the Bronx uh, during the crack epidemic and the crisis of deindustrialization of the 1980s and studied in public schools and found myself in a ruling class institution by chance. And I wanted to understand in college the urban crisis that had um, developed before my eyes when I was a kid that I couldn't understand. My parents um, are from the Dominican Republic and they settled uh, in New York in the late uh, 1960s and they were not political, but I grew up uh, hearing stories about dictatorship and poverty in the Dominican Republic. And so I come to this institution and I know very little about the history that brought me to this moment. And I read Palante. And I was transformed. Uh, I immediately recognized my own history um, as the child of immigrants to the city in the history of the Young Lords. And I felt he here I have um, a series of very profound, dramatic, honest assessments of Puerto Rico, um, the crisis of the city, um, the experience of being the go-between, an interlocutor between your parents and the new society and state bureaucracies like the police department, the hospital, the um, the welfare office, that was my experience. And I was transformed. Uh, I was coming of age politically. Um, I, I'll say that uh, when I was accepted to Brown, Brown was a need aware campus. That meant that it actually looked at students' ability to pay in the admissions process. And I was part of the first class that was um, need, a, need blind. Did I say it the other way around? So bl Brown was need aware. That meant that it looked at your ability to pay in order to accept you. And I was part of the first need blind class. But then it became need aware again. And in the 1990s, students took over University Hall in protest of this policy that disproportionately discriminated against students of color and poor students in general. So I was coming of age politically and what, as we are seeing today, when people are coming of age politically, they always want to learn about the, the movements last time. And because of the Young Lords and the, the ways in which they <coughs> continue to inspire young people like myself, I decided that I wasn't going to go to law school like my parents expected me to, but rather that I would um, study history because I was committed to the transformation of society, um, like the Young Lords. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I decided to go to graduate school, and I wrote the first dissertation on the Young Lords. Uh, Daryl? Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> My story of coming to the Young Lords is, it actually shares some similarities. Um, and I write about it a little bit in the book because I think it's important to situate myself in, uh, in this research project, right? S to come to terms with, uh, with where my voice fits into this stuff. And for me, it was, it was a little bit later. It was in graduate school. Um, I thought I'd kind of figured everything out. I was uh, you know, comfortable with the kind of, uh, theoretical zeitgeist. I was going to write a dissertation that was a uh, psychoanalytic critique of ballots as the sublime object of democracy. Feel free to laugh. That is funny. Um, although I think pro perhaps still a good project. Um, and it was supposed to be, uh, in what was supposed to be my last semester of coursework, 
Uh, I took a class from a, a new professor in the department, Phaedra Petzulo, who's now at uh, the University of Colorado. And uh, we, it was a class on feminist rhetoric. And she, uh, we'd been reading uh, different methodological pieces, uh, including some stuff on feminist autoethnography. And she encouraged me to, uh, and she kind of took me aside and said, hey, you know, why, don't, why don't you write something about you know, your Puerto Rican heritage? And I was like, for reals? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I can do that? And she was the first professor ever. Right? This is what's supposed to be my last class as a graduate student. First professor ever to, to really encourage me to do that. Um, and so, you know, I had some ideas of where to start, but I went to an anthology. I went to Roberto Santiago's Boricua's Influential Puerto Rican Writings, something like that. Uh, and two things happened. One is that uh, I, I got poetry for the first time. The piece that opens that anthology is uh, Sandra Maria Esteves is Here. Uh, and I read that poem in a coffee shop and cried uh, because I'd never really experienced the kind of emotion of poetry before that point. Uh, and the second thing that happens, I stumbled across the Young Lords. There's a piece in there, I think, by Felipe Luciano uh, that, that, was, uh, that was from the, I think it was the Palante newspaper or maybe it was the book, uh, and immediately had this moment of identification, right? Not necessarily with the with the upbringing in the city, because I'm I'm a I'm a Washington Rican. <laughs> I grew up in Washington State. Uh, there were no other Puerto Ricans around. Um, uh, but but what I identified with was the 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 experience of kind of second generation Puerto Ricans, the experience of alienation from language, from history, from culture, from politics, uh, and I wanted to know more. Right? And from that moment, I, I knew that I needed to, to do a research project on the Young Lords. And so it started that semester, uh, which ended up not being my last semester in graduate school. Um, and you know, I did as much work as I could from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, but it's kind of hard to research the New York Young Lords from there. So I started coming to New York as often as I could, uh, as often as, as I could get money to do. Um, and uh, I never looked back. So, uh, uh, Iris, when you hear these stories of this other generation suddenly finding themselves when they <coughs> they read about what you did, uh, 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 why don't? How did you get attracted to the Lords, and and how have you assessed uh, uh, the impact of the group uh, on? other the f generations that follow? That's two questions in one. Okay. So I'll try and do my best. Okay. Um, my experience is, is similar to actually Joanna's and Daryl's in the sense that uh, I also uh, was discovering who I was. I grew up in a working class um, family a uh, very traditional Puerto Rican family. And so I got to see poverty and racism up very close. You know, we're talking about growing up in the 50s and 60s in New York City. Um, in high school, uh, I decided that I needed to organize my building, uh, uh, the, t uh, the tenants in, in the building that I lived because we had no heat and hot water and because we had rats in our apartments. And so it just made sense to me. Uh, I read my father's newspaper and it said that by law, you needed to have um, heat at a certain level. And so I thought I would call the landlord and tell him that, you know. <laughs> um, and of, of course, he was furious. <laughs> with me and got and that was my first uh, interaction with uh, kind of an uh, authority um, but I became involved with a local organization to organize tenants uh, I recently attended my high school reunion and was reminded that I also belong to the human relations club in high school and to uh, the NAACP youth group uh, I went on to City College. I was part of the pilot that later became the SEEK program. And we were an experiment. And uh, underprivileged uh, kids, I guess that's what they called us then, was underprivileged. Uh, we were the ones that had needed remediation 
in order to, um, you know, to make it through college. So I made a commitment to attend for uh, college for, for five years instead of four because we needed a year of remediation. So that was another period of transformation because in, the, in tenant organizing, I was organizing uh, uh, rent strikes uh, and I learned a lot of lessons like you never go in and talk to authority alone because they will lie on you and say that, that you agreed to certain things that you didn't agree to. So that was a harsh lesson for me to learn when I went to talk to the landlord representing uh, the, the community or the tenants and he turned around and, and lied on me. So, that, so I was learning lessons about how you go about organizing. But by the time that I got to college, I realized that, that you know, a college was like, it was just like something that I thought I would never be able to do. It was not something that I was ever encouraged to do. As a matter of fact, my high school uh, counselor said I was not college material. I, I guess that's why I went and got all these degrees, just to get back at, at them and say, yeah, I can do it. Um, but college was, transformative in another way. Um, I realized that, that, um, that we, were, we had been excluded as a people and there were 117 of us in this uh, pilot program, uh, 117 African American and, and Puerto Ricans, primarily working class uh, from the neighborhoods across New York City. And we were all gaining a political consciousness at that point. There were no Puerto Rican student organizations, so I helped organize the uh, first uh, Puerto Rican student organization. I was a member of Onyx prior to getting involved uh, with the Puerto Rican students because you kind of had to choose. Are you going to go with the white organization? You're going to go with the black organization? And I felt um, more in common, my history more in common <laughs> with the African American. About that time, I started teaching in, in a street academy, uh, the Academy for Black and Latin Education, and we, most of the kids, they were teenagers, I mean, we were just, I guess, a little older than them, but the, most of them were hooked on drugs. And so the uh, director of our program went to the local hospital to try and get, um, the young people some treatment and the, of course the hospital refused. So this would become a kind of a mantra in my life going forward. So uh, we took over the administrative offices of the hospital and we were able to achieve uh, 13 beds for adolescents, the first beds for teenagers in the city. Um, I went on and I'm becoming increasingly uh, politicized because you know, there's a worldwide moment. This was not just uh, the Young Lords or Iris Morales, this was a worldwide movement that was taking place. And in the course of that, I traveled to, um, to Denver for a, a conference, and I met Chacha Jimenez there. I later met uh, and engaged in lots of conversations with H. Rep. Brown and was influenced by his ideas. And I traveled to Cuba. So uh, by the time that I joined the Young Lords, it, was, it, it felt to me like it was a natural progression of my history uh, and of my, uh, my political commitment to social transformation, to changing society and to contributing something. I want to add before I go to Mickey that um, uh, uh, Iris mentioned her father and her working class roots. After, when I've been at the Daily News, I guess for about seven or eight years, I get a call one day from a reader who also works at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And he says, Mr. Gonzalez, you have to write an article about this guy who's about to retire. All right, uh, he's, he's been working at the Waldorf Astoria for I think it was what, 47 years? Mm -hmm. 47 years, and he's never been late, and he's never been absent. <laughs> and, and, and all the employees, he's like the most loved employee at the Waldorf, and uh, 
uh, and you've got to do something. And I said, 47 years and never been absent? Are you sure about that? So sure enough, I went, I said, okay, I'll check it out. So I go down there, I talk to all the supervisors. Sure enough, this man had never been late and never been absent in 47 years, and he had met over the years all of the He'd met presidents, you know, uh, movie stars, everybody who had come in and out of the Waldorf Astoria. He had met them, and they knew him personally. So I write this article, you know, the news plays it big, and then I get a call from uh, Iris, and uh, Iris says, "You know, Juan, that was my father you wrote about." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, Mickey, <laughs> how did you get to the young lords? <laughs> Um, uh, before I start, I just want to say two things. Uh, one is that um, in the treaty, an acknowledgement of what today is, and it's September 23rd. Uh, by this time in Puerto Rico in 1868, uh, people were fighting for independence uh, from Spain, and it was an anti-imperialist and anti-slavery struggle led by Ramón Emeterio Vazances. So um, I think it's important to mention that. And the other thing I'd like to mention is that um, um, I've been doing a bunch of these presentations, and I just want to dedicate at least my part of the presentation, if not this entire presentation, to the release of Oscar Lopez Rivera. And we hope um, that the Pope put that in Obama's ear today. Um, you know, the story, um, there's a thread that runs through all the stories, and it's about trying to find out um, who you are um, at a particular point in your life. and. Uh, for me, I had, um, I had a couple of uh, really great accomplices. Um, and one, the main one was Pablo Yeruga Guzman, who I met at, uh, at Westbury. I had met Felipe. We were also part of the Sikh program, but we went to the elite school out in Queens. And we were the only black and Latinos um, at Queens College at the time. And this was like 1967. Um, Felipe was just coming out of, out of jail. He had been involved with some gang fights. Um, I heard he but on my pretty nigger, and I just went up to him and just connected with him, and we've been connected ever since. Um, I'm failing out of Queens College because it's, you know, as Richard Perez would call it, a Eurocentric education. I couldn't see myself in any of the courses, and I was failing. Um, State University at Old Westbury opens up with a concept of University of the Streets that connects me back to El Barrio, where I had been working with an organization called the Real Great Society. Um, and we had a concept of the University of the Streets. Anyway, I got accepted to um, the State University at Old Westbury. There were 74 of us that opened up the university in 68. And Pablo Yudova Guzman was uh, one of those people that um, was, well, that he was Pablo. At the, he was Paul at the time, actually. Um, <laughs> so um, just to show you the progression of how we became who we are today. So Pablo and I, um, you know, we're, we, we, we go to uh, microfiche. I guess I'm dating myself here again. All right? Now it's computers. But we go to microfiche, and we had certain dates in our minds, and we just wanted to see, you know, what these dates meant. You know, we you know, had 1868. We had uh, the Spanish-American War in 1917. And, and slowly began to uncover this history that we had no idea about. Um, you know, it was perhaps... Um, and we'd like to believe that it was consciously kept away from us. But once we um, discovered this history, and once we discovered this seminal figure um, who pointed our internal compass to N, and it wasn't to North, it was really to nationalism, Don Pedro Albizo Campos, um, we kind of decided that we were revolutionary nationalists, and this was the history um, and tradition, you know, the trajectory that we wanted to follow. Um, again, the war in Vietnam was a great influence. The other great influence, I think, that influenced all movements in this country was the black civil rights movement. Um, and it was a period of people reaffirming, you know, who they were, you know. So the Chicanos uh, went through that process. The Native Americans went through that process. The Asians went through that process. Um, and for us, it was, um, it was a very similar process, you know. Uh, embracing a history um, that talks about struggle, embracing a history that talks about justice, embracing a history that talks about sovereignty and independence. And, um, um, and then, that, you know, for me that was basically it. I, you know, I had met Felipe at Queens College. I met uh, Juan Gonzalez on the steps of Lowe Library when he was the chairman of the Student Strike Committee. 
uh, when they took over Columbia University. And my only introduction to him, which was a real good introduction, was that I, was, I played baseball with his two cousins, uh, Louis and Sergio Gonzalez. And they used to talk about him as this brilliant guy. In the meantime, Sergio taught Greek and Latin classical literature at Iona College um, at some point. Um, so I said, listen, I play baseball with your, you know, with, uh, with your cousins. And we were having a struggle in East Tallinn at that time. And again, my thing was, you know, yeah, it's a university. You know, you're Latino, connect to the struggle. And basically, the members of the Student Strike Committee and members of SDS came to El Barrio that, uh, that summer to support, um, support a position that we had in El Barrio because at the time it was the anti-poverty programs, right? So some people got money, some people didn't get money. So we organized a group of people that had gotten funded to reject our money. We weren't going to accept our money until everybody in East Harlem got their money for their programs. Um, and eventually everybody did. Uh, but Wong came over and, and supported that. Um, and that, that for me was basically the, the nucleus. I mean, I, I felt and I still do feel um, that these you know, young men um, that I had known from different parts of my life were brilliant. Um, and um, you know, we each had something to contribute. And I knew that Juan would connect with Pablo and you know, that there were connections there. And they just didn't know that. I knew that because I had known them. Um, and basically, you know, we started the Sociedad del Viso Campos, and that, uh, that, mit, that was the midwife for the young lords. I wanted to ask, what's the big deal, uh, given the fact that the life of the young lords was really brief, uh, uh, from about 1969, so depending on who you listen to, or <laughs> Uh, the, the end point of the Young Lords is a matter of much debate, uh, what years the group actually disintegrated or didn't. But it, it, everyone would agree it was a brief period. Uh, uh, why all this attention to what is essentially a brief period in the life of a, a national minority here in the United States? And, uh, and is it warranted? Uh, is it overblown? Uh, and uh, I throw that to the, to the more uh, objective scholars on each end over here. Uh, and uh, Daryl, you want to start? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you should call me an objective scholar on, right. this, on this question. But I mean, I, I think that I, for me, there's a, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that the Young Lords, it, what, it wasn't just that it was a brief period in of time, but it was a very important point in time. Uh, and the Young Lords were uh, we're really, you know, d depending on how you count one of, if not the first radical, uniquely New Yorican uh, organization post uh, Red Scare, right, post McCarthy era, um, and helped to, to really kind of uh, ignite the community in some, in some substantial ways. I mean, it wasn't even, you know, no one, no one ever, ever really confirms numbers of membership and stuff like that. But uh, the fact that you had you know, 10,000 people marching on the United Nations, right, whether they were all members of the Young Lords or not, is kind of immaterial. You've m the, the organization mobilized the community uh, in significant ways, and in ways that are worth remembering. Right? And I think that's, you know, for me, that's, that's, uh, that's why I do this work, is that you know, I, I was surprised to not to have never heard anything about the organization uh, when, I, when I first started coming across the stuff. And there was really very little scholarship on the group. Um, and, and that's still a surprise to me. Right? It's great to see there's more and more stuff coming out. But there should be you know, twice, three times as much scholarship on the Young Lords uh, because they were so significant at that moment and because we still have so much to learn from the Young Lords organization. Right? I mean, even with our books coming out, you know, there's, there's still many more books to be written, many more perspectives to be offered, many more interpretations of the significance of the organization um, that, uh, that, that we ought to be exploring and encouraging. John? So the question is, why the interest in the Young Lords? Um, uh, I think we can answer this from the perspective of the period and we can answer the question from the perspective of today. Um, the Young Lords is a cult classic um, and has been a cult classic. 
uh, within movement circles. Uh, so people who lived through that period, whenever you say the Young Lords, something lights up in them. Uh, and I think that that's the case because the Young Lords engaged in dramatic, smart, humorous activism that consciously used the media to grow its ranks, um, but also its reputation. Uh, so the Young Lords occupied buildings. Um, it offered a vision of the world. Uh, it had a newspaper, and it modeled itself after the Young Lords, uh, after the Black Panther Party. That all those things made it iconic. It didn't only engage in service uh, activism like the Black Panthers did. It actually engaged in agitation in the streets, which is different um, from the Black Panthers. So that made it um, a cult classic. In many ways, it was able to do that here in New York because the Black Panther Party had been persecuted and pretty much rooted out by COINTELPRO and persecution, and there was a vacuum um, that the Young Lords filled. So that's why the Young Lords are remembered um, it, among people of that period. Um, but then you have this issue that the Young Lords actually leaves behind one of the most powerful accounts of its own history with the publication of Palante, um, which is a compilation of oral histories, but also of photographs um, of the Young Lords. And, and that then draws in people like myself and Daryl who happen upon this lost history and I think that that history is important because it captures the experience of Spanish-speaking people in the United States brilliantly, Puerto Ricans uh, and non-Puerto Ricans. And it connects millions of young people um, to their history, people who, are, who feel themselves outsiders in America. So in many ways, the young lords um, taps into this dominant theme in American history, the experience of migration and immigration, even though the young lords are Puerto Ricans, are, they're, they're not immigrants, they're citizens of the nation. Um, I want to say that, um, the, and I'll talk about this a little later, but the fact that the young lords decided that they were going to ally with the Black Panther Party made all the difference. And that's why they are remembered and other groups are not. The Black Panthers were the most iconic group of the period. It was the, of the Black Panther, uh, of the Black Power Movement. It was the group that captured the imagination of a generation. And I think that that the reason why that connection happened was because originally the Young Lords was a gang in Chicago. And as gang members, those Puerto Rican and Mexican poor kids had absolutely no connection and no, um, no allegiance to the politics of respectability within the Puerto Rican community. And they were the people at the bottom. And they said, we're just gonna throw our lot with the most maligned, the most persecuted group in Chicago, the Black Panther Party. I don't think that the New York Young Lords were ready to do that. But once that connection was made in Chicago, it captured their imagination and it made sense to go there and investigate what that was about. I just wanna end by saying, um, so, so part of what the Young Lords in Chicago did was that they defied Puerto Rican social taboos about associations with African Americans and the black people in America. Um, that's, when you do that, when you have the courage to stand up and do that, you're gonna be remembered. Um, 
And no other group did that in a, such a conscious way. But the question that was asked was, why, um, why all this attention uh, on the young lords right now? Why is this such an obsession? I think that um, interest has been made, developed, and demanded by people who have documented the history of the Young Lords. And the people who've been working on the Young Lords have essentially made arguments that if you want to understand the 60s, if you want to understand the Civil Rights and Black Power Movement and the Vietnam War and how America has been changed, you have to understand the Young Lords. That has, so, so interest has been made and developed. It hasn't been born. How has it been made and developed? Um, there was an exhibit that was initiated in the 1980s by Marta Moreno Vega um, that was very important. Um, this is on the, on the issue of exhibits. I co-curated an exhibit a long time ago, like 10 years ago, at the University of North Carolina titled Radicals in Black and Brown. It was the first time that Black Panthers and Young Lords came together to talk about that period since it happened. I co-curated co that with Joseph Jordan. And then there's the, the exhibit that's now happening that's gotten all of this, um, that, that has gotten all of this attention. Um, films were made. Iris Morales made Palante Siempre Palante in the 1990s. And that was inserted in the mainstream through PBS. So that laid the groundwork. Um, dissertations were written. I wrote a dissertation. Um, Daryl wrote a dissertation. Books were published. Mickey Melendez published We Took the Streets. Um, Daryl published the anthology and now his book. Um, and there are a small number of academics who are making arguments about the centrality of the young lords to um, understanding our contemporary um, notions of democracy in America. Um, so, so it's a combination of internal and external forces that are making the young lords relevant. And then there's the issue that we are in the Black Lives Matter movement um, and moment. And, and as I said previously, whenever there is a social movement, people want to know how did they do it and what are the lessons of the past. Well, you know, I, I, I just want to remind people of a quote that Edward Said, uh, the, the great literary and cultural critic, once uh, said, I, I don't, I, I should have remembered to bring it so I could quote it exactly, but I more, remember it more or less. Uh, he said in Culture and Imperialism uh, that uh, uh, imperialism is not content merely with seizing a people's land. Mm. Uh, but it is it, it it must empty the people's the minds of the people uh, of their own history and their own knowledge and their own culture in order to fully conquer them and uh, and, and I, I've always maintained that the great uh, accomplishment of the young lords was freeing our minds uh, not necessarily the territory but our minds uh, to think in different ways and I'd be interested in seeing how Iris and uh, and uh, Mickey see this whole issue of is this uh, is all this attention worthwhile <laughs> or necessary? Well, I want to pick up on the uh, point of Black Lives Matter, and I think that it's critical to understand that, especially in periods where movements are on the rise, people look to find themselves in history, and people also look. Uh, for guidance or for or strategies, for uh, ideas. We did that. That's why we went to study history. But I flip it and I think about it in a slightly different way. I, this was a, 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 a very momentous time in world history, and I want to situate us within that context. I think that it would have been shameful for the Puerto Ricans not to have uh, resisted at that moment in history when the whole world was fighting colonialism. When uh, the United, in the United States you had uh, uh, African Americans dismantling uh, apartheid. 
I think it would have been shameful that the Puerto Ricans uh, did not take a stand when we had our own history of fighting imperialism in, in Puerto Rico. And when we, as the first generation, I think why we are also important and looked to is that we were opening a new chapter of urban Puerto Ricans. We were the first generation after the, a huge migration. I mean, we can talk about what's happening today. That's a whole other topic. But at that moment, we were the children of a huge migration. And so the young lords really represented, in, in my mind, uh, the hopes and the aspirations and, and also the revolutionary spirit of a people. So if you look at our 13-point program, we started out with, we want the liberation of Puerto Ricans in the United States. And we ended with, we want a socialist society. And in between, we talked about the, the US military out of every country in the world. We talked about uh, the support to third world people. We talked about um, armed struggle. So we had a comprehensive vision and we had great ideas. We were not able to accomplish all those ideas, but we were able to project the, the best uh, uh, of what that generation could offer, and so we inspired others. The Young Lords becomes the focal point as the organization that uh, embodied this, especially through the 13-point program in the early days. But it was a whole generation that got involved. There were other organizations that developed. And uh, uh, the people that were inspired went on to create institutions, went on to create art. And you know, sometimes people say, well, why does the young lords get all the attention? So to correct that, it was a whole generation. And the fact that we're still, some of us are still alive also then allows people to still connect with us and find out those stories, you know, that at least there can be, uh, you know, a, a personal connection to that history. But I always think about that it, it would be shameful if we went back and we looked at our history and the Puerto Ricans were not involved at, at that particular moment when the whole world is changing, when the country's changing. In terms of the African American perspective, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand, or maybe it's I don't agree with uh, uh, Joanna, because uh, the experience of the African American and the Puerto Ricans in New York City, uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans had worked together on everything, on education, on jobs. Uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans had worked together on, on everything in the universities, in the high schools. We live side by side. Those migrations, the migration from, from, uh, uh, from the South and the Puerto Rican migration met in urban uh, settings. We worked in, in, in factories together. We attended the same emergency rooms. We attended the same schools. Uh, oftentimes, if there were uh, no services for African Americans. There were no services for uh, uh, Puerto Ricans. As I mentioned earlier, uh, at, at uh, City College, there was no Puerto Rican student organization. I joined the African American organization. Now, that's not to say that the relationship was, you know, always, you know, great and there were no conflict. There was a lot of uh, uh, conflict and a lot of debate, but we struggled together. And I think that that was also something that was very significant about the Young Lords and why people look to it is that most of our work was coalition. We worked with everybody. We worked with the, we worked with Iwakun, which many of you may not know. How many of you know who Iwakun was? Okay, I see the activists know. <laughs> <laughs> Iwakun, an Asian organization, Chinese organization. We worked with uh, uh, Chicanos. We worked with uh, African Americans. We worked with poor whites. And in New York City, all of our coalition work, whether it was at Lincoln Hospital or it was at a university, it was the squatters, it was a lot of coalition work. And I think that that's another, uh, uh, another reason why people, sometimes people bump into the history because they're looking at you know, the Indo-Chinese Women's Conference that took place in Canada, and they say, wow, they were young lords there, who were they, you know? 
uh, or they bump into us in another way. So I think that we have to open the lens and, and also that the history of the Young Lords, yeah, there's a debate about the ending, uh, the year, but it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And what we study is mainly the revolutionary rise, which is great. We should study the revolutionary rise because we need to have more revolutionary rising. But we also, we also need to understand the downfall. And because we have movements that are developing, and we need to know what those lessons are uh, uh, for, and the role of the government. We can have a conversation about the role of COINTELPRO, which is very important, and we only have snippets of actually what happened. Some of us got files, and Joanna's uh, uh, fighting has a, a lawsuit to get the files from the New York City police. We need to find out. But in general terms, we know that the organization was infiltrated and some of the stuff that happened, especially toward the end, um, points to the government hand in that. If by the time that uh, the young lords came into existence, the FBI had already killed Fred Hampton. They already had plenty of experience in terms of dismantling social movements. I believe they learned from that experience. They didn't directly kill our leaders, but they were certainly torture, beatings, and, and psychological manipulation. So I think that the history is, is very rich in what it offers us both in terms of, of what we learn from it, in terms of it, its, its failings, but also in terms of what the contributions were, like working in coalitions, multi-issues, working with the media, and other things that people have mentioned. Uh, Mickey? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. I think the topic has been um, you know, really um, covered. I, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I'm gonna take a couple of pages, well, a couple of sentences from uh, Eddie Figueroa's um, narrative about this period. Um, I think he said that this was the most significant political, social, and cultural event of our generation. Um, and he also said that uh, one of the reasons for that was that we were able to tell the story. Our parents could not tell the story. Um, we were able to tell the story because they came and they worked, and as Pedro Petri said, they became assistant, assistant to the assistant, assistant, <laughs> uh, to help us and get through college because education was the way out of the slums and the ghetto. Um, and um, so they, they were just preoccupied and they just wanted to come and work and, and find the best possible life uh, for their children. Um, the problem was with them, when their children um, went up against the institutions of this society, uh, we had and we experienced the same things that many other people did. So we were able to expose um, those lies. And the way we did it, I think that, um, and, and again, this was kind of you know learning. Nobody had ever done any of this before. But again, I go back to what I had said before. These were like all the men and women um, that did these, these planning were really exceptional people. Um, so one of the things that we became known for were media events, you know? But, um, you know, there were media events that had a lot of significance to them. Because one of the things that I think that people and the community, there was, there was really no difference between the young lords and the community. Once the community understood that we were dedicated to service at the point of armed struggle. Well, what did that mean for us? That meant that we'll get, we will get in between you. You know, if you're a student, we will get in between you and the cop that's coming through the door. If, it, it mean, if, it, if you're a patient at a hospital, it means that we will be there to defend you. And I think that that really resonated and that really took root um, with, our, with our community in a very real way. And there's some real demonstrations about this, um, whether people agree or disagree with a particular action of taking the church armed, um, and I think Denise tells the story in a great way, 
um, the way people took those guns and those rifles um, out of that church were basically what we call in our community the doñas, you know, the, the elderly women with the little bun in their head that, you know, seemed very uh, benign. They took out guns in different, pe you know, in different uh, dismantle. Uh, many of them were inoperable, um, again, but that's, that was the connection that we had with the community. Certain things happened as the time went on that um, wedged that, that confidence that we had. But, um, I, I, and uh, the other piece of this is that um, I think a lot of people learned, you know, a lot of people learned about media, a lot of people learned about law. Um, so I don't think it's any surprise that I would say close to 10 or 15 people that were kind of in the leadership, men and women of the Young Lords, went on to have great journalistic careers and, and legal careers and um, uh, careers in the media. Um, because it was, they had their apprenticeship in the Young Lords, um, you know, to some extent. I want to get to this whole issue is that, that Iris mentioned before of uh, uh, looking at some of the failings and the, and the weaknesses and uh, uh, so we get a more well-rounded view. But first I'd like to sort of um, get some, each of the folks to share with us some of the stuff that they have done. Uh, I asked everybody to prepare either if they, in their, from their writings, like a, a two or three minute, their, their favorite from their, their works. And, uh, and Iris has been kind enough to prepare for us a clip uh, from uh, Siem, uh, Palante Siempre Palante. So you can get an actual uh, feel for uh, some of, the, uh, uh, some of the, the different perspectives that everybody here at the table brings. Uh, so uh, uh, Iris, do you want to introduce this, uh, this clip? or? It's just um, an opening. I thought it was going to be just to show what we've done. So it's just the opening and the ending. It's three minutes. In the 70s, young Puerto Ricans organized for the empowerment of their communities across the United States. During the 1960s and 70s, young Puerto Ricans organized for the empowerment of their communities across the United States. Among the 
Among the organizations that emerged were the movement pro-independence, El Comité, the Puerto Rican Student Union, and the Young Lords. On the whole, we were first generation born and or raised in this country. And we found as we started going out into the world that the society was a very white society. And the conditions in the community at that time were dire. Um, there were a lot of drugs. The housing was abominable. The health care was non-existent. It was a struggle as I was growing up in the city. And I saw a lot in the communities. And I saw the system in this community not helping any of the people that I relate to every day. I joined the Young Lords out of anger. We all had a tremendous sense that our people did not deserve the kind of situation and the kind of condition that we were living under. That our parents had worked just as hard as anyone else to make a better life for us. And for some reason, we weren't succeeding. And uh, so we had that commitment that we were going to change things. And it didn't matter what had to be done, but that we were going to change things. The Young Lords are remembered for promoting Puerto Rican history and pride, initiating Serve the People programs, and taking direct action to get response to Latino concerns. Latino, Latino. Their activism inspired a generation who also took action for Latino empowerment. Today, Latinos continue to face economic, social, and political discrimination. And once again, Latino youth are organizing for social justice and human rights. That was the, uh, uh, that, uh, that aired, uh, uh, 81, was it 1996, was it? Yeah, yeah in, in, in 1996, uh, it, it uh, aired on uh, PBS. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask Daryl if you could uh, pick a favorite, uh, set, you know, Few graphs from his his work, so you get a sense of the their their actual writing and their actual artistic production in terms of looking at the perspective, analyzing the young lords. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Mine is totally a spoiler. I'm pulling from the conclusion here. I mean, it's a it's a book about the young lords, but it's also a book about decolonial praxis. And so, in the end, I'm turning back to the kind of you know what we can what we can learn and use today. Viewing the young lords as a touchstone, however, is not a call for mimicry. As important as it is to recover their history and cultivate a public memory that highlights the power and commitment of these radical New Yorkans who led a movement that helped spark political and cultural imagination, simply transplanting what they did into our present moment would be a mistake. As I said in the introduction, context is vitally important not just for a critical interpretive praxis seeking to glean insight from situated public discourse, but also for those of us seeking to theorize and stake out a terrain for action in the present. In conceiving of the young lords as a touchstone, we must be careful not to think of them, as Edwin Black puts it, as models for copying. Rather, we must seek to discern key sensibilities, looking for what Black calls vague quality, tastes, that can be made relevant in our present context. My call, therefore, is not for us all to go out and be young lords. I cannot imagine that would go over particularly well in Iowa City, Dallas, Riverside, or even New York, Chicago, Orlando, Philadelphia, or any other major site of, the Puerto, of Puerto Rican migration. We are part of a different time with different cultural and political currents, different public vocabularies and available modes of stranger relationality, and we are constrained substantially by rhetorics of anti-racialism and a racial state that has adjusted to what Rupali Mukherjee and others call the post-Soul era. The infrastructure of US counterterrorism and intelligence communities, persistently preoccupied with notions of threat and security, dwarfs the COINTELPRO of the past and makes mass movement challenging, to say the least. Yet all is not lost. 
quote, much has changed in the United States, argue Amy, Sonny, and James Tracy in the conclusion to their book on white leftists in the 1970s, called Hillbilly Nationalist, by the way. Yet, they continue, it would be a mistake to dismiss the organize your own model as a relic of the past. What additional lessons can be learned from the young lords that would be relevant today? First, rhetorics of community control remain powerful and full of potential. The old maxim, all politics is local, continues to hold truth. Even in an era marked by the rise of neoliberal globalization and transnational information flows that make the world a smaller place for some, local grassroots politics remains relevant and vitally important. The young lords and others in common cause laid an intellectual and practical infrastructure for, in for instigating change by speaking with diverse and allied voices to demand justice in their communities. Rhetorics of community control are malleable enough to have force within the systemic constraints mentioned above, in part because they neither have inherent conflict with neoliberal rhetorics of personal responsibility, nor do they require calling for uh, or operating within a logic of revolution. Instead, at their heart, they retain a decolonial commitment to local knowledge and invite attentiveness to the plurality of interests and perspectives that animate community togetherness commitments that must be retained, cultivated, and strengthened in order to guard against neoliberal co-optation. Second, we need more scholarship examining decoloniality in its specific context of emergence and action. The theoretical foundation of decolonial theory is strong, but the best way to refine it is through detailed engagements of decolonial and decoloniality in practice. My critical interpretive engagement of the young lords helps anchor concepts like delinking, border thinking, and liberation in their rhetorical and performative specificity in a particular time and place that happens to be central to decoloniality's genealogy of thought. Not only does my read of the young lords help us understand better what delinking might look like in practice, but it also helps to build a sense of what delinking can become as a scholarly perspective, directing us to speak from and with the global south as well as to generate spaces for and voices of epistemic disobedience in our disparate scholarly context. And I'll stop there. There's a, there's a couple more points, but. I wanted to ask Mickey to, to, um, to also share with us uh, uh, a favorite passage from his book, and then Joanna to give us a preview, because her book's not out yet. <laughs> Just a, uh, Mickey? Well, I, I don't, uh, I know you have the book there, but I didn't pick, um, didn't pick one out there. What, what I'd like to do instead um, is just point to a, an anecdotal about the Latino movement. Um, and that is that I, I think we have the distinction of having the ability to have freed our political prisoners. Um, we did that in 1978 with Lolita Lebron um, and the other uh, nationalists that came out of jail. We did that in 2000 as uh, Clinton was leaving office um, to do the good grace of Ida Castro, who was the highest ranking Puerto Rican in the administration that led out 17, uh, 17 members of the FLAN. And we also recently did that on December 17, 2014 with the release of the Cuban, uh, of the Cuban Five. And I would just like yeah, um, you know, I'm just using this time. We did it even earlier with Martin Sotre oh. and with Carlos Feliciano and with. Right. Uh, well, these these are people <laughs> that were in jail for like over 20 years or whatever. Right. Right. But the, uh, you know, my point is is that um, we we really do hope that the Pope uh, asked Obama today to release um, Oscar uh, Lopez Rivera, and we really just have you know the rest of Obama's turn um, to do this. Um, and, and, you know, just other, you know, keep other political prisoners in mind. The work that Joanna does with Mumia, uh, Matulu Shakur, Leonard Pertier, I mean, they're all um, pretty moving stories. Um, but Oscal, um, and, you know, just go on the website and connect. You know, there are now 34 women, because it's 34 years. They were 32 women, 33 women. And they do 34 minutes throughout different communities in, the, in, in New York City. Um, where they do petitions and they do kind of um, um, educationals in these communities. Um, so I really would like people to um, just figure out how to participate um, in this because your voice is important. That's what being an activist is, is, is you know, doing something actively and politically. And before I end, I just want to recognize one young lord in the audience, Minelva, Mini. Um, can you get up? Johanna, give us a preview. 
Um, I think that the Young Lords uh, are important because of all of the reforms that they won. They were among uh, few organizations that actually won reforms and, and wrested reforms from, from, this, from the city. Uh, for example, a lot of people don't know that the Young Lords drafted the first patient Bill of Rights. Um, and uh, that is now part of uh, New York's legislation, state legislation. Um, and I can go on and on. A lot of important work around lead poisoning that led to the creation of the Bureau of Lead Poisoning in New York. And the Journal of Public um, uh, Health credits the Young Lords with the passage of that legislation. But ultimately, I think that the Young Lords are important uh, because they transformed the consciousness of their community and in so doing, they were part of a generation that transformed the relationship between people of color and white people in America in ways that we can't really quantify. Um, so I just want to read um, the very introductory, two introductory paragraphs of my, uh, of my book and, and then two paragraphs in between, just to give you a sense of my approach. In the waning days of 1969, the Young Lords were on top of the world. As the decade entered its midnight hour, this ragtag group of college students were doing what so many revolutionaries aim to do but have never brought to fruition. They were creating an alternative society right in their own neighborhood. After abandoning their university studies to build a revolutionary movement, they anchored that movement in their fight with the New York City Church. The Young Lords had merely been looking for a space to feed breakfast to children before school. The priests of the First Spanish United Methodist Church in East Harlem denied them use of its building. Two months after the denial of their initial request, the Young Lords nailed the doors of the church shut after Sunday service and barricaded themselves inside. In their determination to stoke the flames of revolution among Puerto Ricans and African Americans in the city, these radicals made the first Spanish United Methodist Church a staging ground for their vision of a just society. During the daytime, the People's Church opened its doors to the community and became a sanctuary for East Harlem's poor. The Lord served hot meals to school-aged children, helping to institutionalize what is now the federal school breakfast program for children and ran the free medical clinic for members of the community. The Lords taught Puerto Rican and African American history and the history of the Puerto Rican independence movement to anyone who was interested, and in the process created a counter narrative to media representations of Puerto Ricans as junkies, knife wielding thugs, and welfare dependents, and offered an alternative to public school curricula that failed to make sense of the troubles of the poor and the Brown in New York City. Spree speaking through a bullhorn out of a church window to attentive journalists outside, young Lord Iris Benitez explained, quote, the people of El Barrio have forgotten, excuse me, quote, the people of El Barrio have gotten to the point that they don't ask the why of things anymore. They just see things as they exist and try to survive. The young lords know the why, and we're trying to relay that information to the people, unquote. And then I'll end um, with another two paragraphs uh, in the middle of the book. As the young lords came of age, Puerto Rican migrants were heavily concentrated in the lowest paid and most precarious sectors of the economy, with 70% of them employed in hospitals, in the restaurants and hotel trades, and in New York's declining manufacturing industry. These emerging radicals sought to explain the experience of displacement and disillusion that defined their lives growing up in New York amidst the burdens of their parents' working class lives and amidst a nostalgia for a homeland that this next generation barely knew. In the words of young Lord Luis Garden Acosta, quote, 
The young lords were an initiation for a whole generation of people into their culture and their history. All of a sudden, I knew why my mother was angry, why my father was angry, and I no longer could blame them for anything. All of a sudden, I knew that they were victims in a big show because we were Puerto Rican and we were living here and we understood the beauty and the ugliness, but we didn't understand why. The young lords came to <coughs> explain why. The young lords gave not just incisive articulation, but organizational expression to the anger and resistance so palpable among poor and working class Puerto Ricans in the 1960s and 70s. And in their unequivocal pursuit of common cause with the most iconic and progressive group in the black power movement, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords became the most culturally influential per Puerto Rican organization of its time. Staging social grievances with a fierce militancy, infectious irreverence, and a distinctive imagination, the Young Lords tipped the balance among Puerto, Rico, uh, among Puerto Ricans toward pride and organized collective courage. Their activism turned on its head the notion that Puerto Ricans were guests overstaying their welcome in America. In the process, they also disabused New Yorkers of the notion of Puerto Ricans as mild-mannered, submissive people and reawakened the determination of their community to stand up and fight. I'd like to, to take one more round with the panelists and then open it up to your questions. Uh, um, as I was mentioned before, the, um, uh, the, young, the successes of the Young Lords are the subject of much attention, uh, but the failings of the group and the weaknesses less so. I'd like to ask um, those of you here, what in your uh, what from your perspective are the, the failings that you think provide the most important lessons for young people today and, and so for young Latinos and social activists today? Uh, start with uh, Mickey. Mickey. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think very clearly um, we didn't understand, um, and let me also just contextualize this. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the average age of the young laws was between 18 and 22. I mean, we had clusters, you know, unemployed uh, youth, and then we had uh, people kind of at the other end, you know, kind of late 20s. Um, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, and that's not to excuse anything, it's just to context it. So it was basically a, a youth movement for, for the most part. What I think one of our fundamental, looking back at it, um, shortcomings well, was not understanding the importance of building institutions in this society to protect the concessions that you gain <coughs> in a struggle. Um, so for example, uh, one of the very early struggles of, of the uh, movement, of the Latino movement, young lords weren't around at that time, was the takeover of City College for black and Latino study programs. And it was the first place where there was a department. But 25 years, 30 years later, uh, without an institution to protect it, it was downgraded from a department to a program. I mean, and we're in an ins educational institution. We know what all the implications are in terms of funding, in terms of uh, many things. Um, so I, I think the inability, and, and you know, also not watching others other immigrants that came over and the kind of institutions that they have built to protect some of the concessions that, that they had. I also think that um, looking back at the vacuum that we left behind, we did a tremendous amount of politicizing a community. Um, and what happened was, and, and I don't think, you know, we, we weren't ready for this and we weren't even looking at this, <laughs> but what actually happened was that that vacuum that was created was then taken over and galvanized by politicians um, that did not necessarily have the best interests of our people at hand. Uh, people that were not like the young lords ready to serve and protect the community. Um, so they, they, what developed then was a, developed a whole class, a whole um, segment of democratic clubs 
um, that moved in used the nationalism, used the cultural nationalism, used the politics that uh, and the pride of our people um, to get. I mean, and, and if you look at the young lords from you know uh, 72, 73, 74, and the amount of Latinos that were elected from 72, 74 to 1980, it was the, it was a real surge. Um, in the amount of Latinos that were elected. So I, thi I think those two things, and I, I, again, I don't think that we were even prepared or thinking about an electoral strategy at that time, but clearly w we created a vacuum in the electoral arena. Uh, uh, Daryl? So I want to start answering this question by pointing to what I thought, what I think was one of the greatest strengths of the, of the organization. I think, uh, at its best, uh, when it was at its best, uh, it was marked by a certain kind of openness, uh, an openness of ideas, uh, something that some member, I forget who put it this way, uh, described as, as a compatibility, right? They found ways to, to create compatibility between ideas that seemed on face to be contradictory, right? And so rather than try to resolve all of those contradictions, they played in the tensions between them. And I think that made wonderful things happen for the organization. I think it allowed them to develop something that, that I call a kind of ecumenical <laughs> ideology, wherein lots of different ideas and, and people could fit. I think that, uh, that the, the greatest weakness was losing that openness and losing that, uh, that desire for compatibility. Um, or that, or that willingness to to, to I don't want to use the word institutionalize, but to practice that compatibility. Um, and as the organization kind of matured uh, and its ideology became more rigid, um, I think that that that's when problems started to arise. Um, to me, like a, a a big key moment is uh, is when the the organization makes its transition into PRO, into the Puerto Rican Revolutionary Workers Organization. And they publish the, the, the resolutions and speeches of the first uh, and last party Congress. Um, and on the cover of that, uh, of, of that, of that book uh, are images of uh, Marx, Lenin, Mao, Stalin, and... I'm missing, oh, I'm missing one, <laughs> right? Whereas, whereas we left out Trotsky. <laughs> Trotsky, sorry, thank you. It wasn't there. <laughs> um, whereas, whereas prior to that point, the iconography of the group was much more eclectic, right? I mean, you you see pictures from rallies and stuff, and yes, you know, there's photos of of, of Albizu Campos, there's photos of Che, there's uh, all sorts of different you know different different ways of kind of representing and invoking the ideas of the group. And then it kind of gets narrowed down into this into this kind of orthodoxy, and I think it's you know that's right around the same time also that they start closing, uh, start canceling a lot of their community programs and become uh, a bit more a bit more insulated. Um, and so that 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 lack of openness was the was the biggest disadvantage to me. Um, so, Johanna. Oh my God. <laughs> This is not an easy history to <coughs> wrap your head around. Um, first of all, I think we have to we have to start by saying that in the late 1960s, U.S. hegemony, U.S. empire, was challenged by what. Um, the President Johnson, what's his first name? Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson, <laughs> I, I, my mind. By what President Lyndon Johnson called a raggedy ass little third rate nation called Vietnam. And domestically, organizations like the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, the Weather Underground, and a whole host of other radicals were challenging empire from within. And the US government decided that it was going to decapitate the US left so that it wouldn't live another day. And it was a violent decapitation. Um, 
Edis mentioned um, the murder of Fred Hampton, which from today's perspective, this is what the US government accuses Latin American dictatorships of doing, killing dissidents in their beds. And this is what we did in the 60s. I think this is a very difficult conversation to have because there were internal reasons why the young lords declined, but those paled in comparison to the repression unleashed against radicals by the state. I think that the murder of Julio Roldan intensified um, the sense that members were the targets of the state in the Young Lords. It created a siege mentality um, in the organization, in its ranks, that fueled bitterness, um, disenchantment, and the sense that there was no hope in American democracy. Um, Julio Roldan was a Young Lord who was found hanged in a local prison in the tombs. Uh, the Young Lords occupied the first Spanish Methodist Church for the second time, this time with arms. And that led the Young Lords into a slippery slope of more radical militant action. But at the same time, the fact that they occupied the church with arms led to an investigation into the killing of a citizen, formally by the city of New York that condemned in pretty strong language the criminal justice system in the United States. It was the first time that this had happened. And I have documents that say that over a thousand copies of this study were requested by other cities across the country. So I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna judge and say that the Young Lords should not have taken over that church as they did because it actually produced some real reform. But that occupation opened up the door to the move to Puerto Rico, abandoning, um, abandoning our uh, base of operations here in New York for greener pastures in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, what is imp what's important to understand is that what's happening to the Young Lords is not isolated. This was a trend in the movement. People were moving and going to Africa and other places in the third world because it was believed that that's where the revolution was happening. So for example, Eldridge Cleaver is in Algeria building um, uh, a chapter of the Black Panther Party there and for Puerto Ricans, who are the only minority group in the United States that can lay claim to a piece of land. It made sense um, to try to liberate Puerto Rico, especially given that the Young Lords and other radicals of the period misread the period. They thought that revolutions were, were in the horizon when they were not. This is a product of the political youthfulness and inexperience um, of the Young Lords. Um, I'm going to end in a minute. Um, essentially, one of the things that I discovered um, w was that the Young Lords removes itself from the community. It loses its connection to the grassroots. Um, and that means that it loses sense of reality. Previously, the community could check the Young Lords and what it was doing. But when it removes itself with the Young Lords, it has no check on its dogmatism and, a, and the adoption of more and more radical um, ideas. Um, I agree with Daryl that in the beginning, and this is something that uh, Juan has mentioned to me, in the beginning, the organization uh, was dynamic and a lot of different ideas existed alongside of each other. Black nationalism with Puerto Rican revolutionary nationalism, with socialism, and cult the cultural nationalism of, say, of Felipe Luciano. But that ends, and that ends in part because of, 
of the disconnection of the young lords to the grassroots, and then you have government repression, which dovetails with the notion that they adapt from Mao's cultural revolution that you have to root out the enemies of the people. So this is something they adopt from China and graft onto the American experience, which in fact is the same strategy of the counterintelligence program of, of the FBI. What, what does that program want to do? It wants to increase paranoia, distrust, and internal violence um, within these organizations. And the young lords are becoming increasingly dogmatic and they are looking for enemies of the people within the organization. They stop identifying the state as public enemy number one. Finally, I'll end by saying that Gloria Fontanes, who was a leading member of the organization in its last days, married a COINTELPRO agent by the name of Don Wright, with whom she had a child. And Don Wright beat and abused her um, and encouraged her own, um, her own, stoked her own personal psychological issues that then was deployed against the membership of the Young Lords. So we can't, gover government infiltration, I think, is, is paramount here in understanding not just what happened to the Young Lords, but what happened to the history of the 60s uh, movements. Okay, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Iris to um, give us a wrap on her sense of what was the, the main failings that... Well, everyone has lessons. said uh, a lot of things um, which open doors into more conversations, but to answer uh, Huang's question, if I were talking uh, to s some of the young activists leading movements today, I would say to be mindful of the types of organizations that you're creating. And tied to what um, you know, everyone has said, the strength of the Young Lords was its ties to the community. Uh, we came from the community. You've heard our histories. We were familiar with what the day-to-day -day issues were because of our organizing. And we started, when we lost that, and we lost that through the organizational form becoming much more centralized, autocratic, and uh, decision making in the hands of one or two people, and that was a mistake. Now we were at a point in time where we thought we were at war, we were at war with the US government, and so we had organized in a military style and we practiced something that we called democratic centralism. Unfortunately, the centralism outweighed the democracy, and increasingly so. And so I would say that that is um, a very important consideration for young people, and I understand, uh, uh, especially when I hear Black Lives Matter, that you know they're not going for this hierarchy, and that's a good thing. So uh, that's one thing that I would say. I think I had another thing, but I'm, I'm going to leave it for conversation afterwards, but. Okay, uh, uh, I think we're going to try to open it up to questions from the audience, uh, and, and I want to emphasize questions from the audience, uh, and, uh, and hopefully the panelists will also try to keep it with short answers so we can get as many questions as we can uh, in. Uh, I think there are going to be two students who have mics on either side, so if you, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and then they'll come up to you. And uh, uh, who wants to start it off? Uh, right over here to the left. Uh, Luis Reyes. Uh, Luis Reyes, OK. Yeah. Luis, welcome. <laughs> Go ahead. I wanted to ask about the makeup of the Young Lords Party in Chicago uh, as compared to the makeup of the Young Lords Party in New York. I'm struck by the narratives of this evening uh, because everybody talked about being in college, getting to college, uh, et cetera, and 
uh, having seen some pictures on the website of the Young Lords uh, in uh, Chicago that Chacha Jimenez, I believe, created, uh, one, I noticed that a lot of the pictures seemed more of working class people. And I wonder if that's just an impression or a mis misperception, but is that a difference and what impact might that difference have made in how the Young Lords in New York and the Young Lords in Chicago developed over the years? Who wants to tackle that? Um, one of my, my favorite chapters of my book is my first chapter, which is a history of the transformation of the Young Lords from gang to political organization. And I interviewed the Young Lords in Chicago at length. The culture in the Chicago was completely different from the culture of um, the Young Lords in New York. The Young Lords in New York and its leadership was composed of first generation college educated working class Puerto Ricans. So I agree that there was really no significant difference between the Young Lords and the community community they were organizing because they came from that community in the main. Approximately five to 10% of the New York organization was composed of the lumpen proletariat. That is the class identified by Marx as the people at the bottom of society who are not connected to regular work. The young lords in Chicago were the lumpen proletariat. Um, but they were the children of working class Puerto Rican migrants to Chicago who abandoned school uh, because of racism, because they felt alienated, because um, they didn't find meaning in school. So they entered into uh, a process of a relationship with the criminal justice system. And this is part of what I was discussing earlier. Um, I do agree that the young lords in New York and in Chicago, uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans worked alongside of each other. And there's a, a strong history in the 60s of, of black and Puerto Rican activists fighting against the segregation of the schools. It's an incredible history. Um, I interviewed um, uh, someone whose name I can't remember now, but he organized um, 20,000 Puerto Ricans to go to the March on Washington, which no one knows. Um, Gilberto Jerena Valentin. Um, uh, but, but I actually think that the reason why that connection was made so clearly between the Black Panthers and the Young Lords was because of the gang uh, uh, roots of the Chicago organization and their relationship with Fred Hampton. Um, that made the difference. The ideas were, were, were attractive in New York and a lot of the members of the Young Lords thought of joining the Black Panther Party, but no one had thought of actually trans creating an organization that was the Puerto Rican counterpart to the Black Panther Party. Anyway, it's, it's a long history. I talk about it in my book, um, but it's an important thing. And in Chicago, it was, it was Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. Uh, who, join, who joined and led the Young Lords, Mexican-Americans. Next question. Uh, let's get the one back there, and then we'll get you. OK, uh, back there. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Arnaldo Cruz Malave. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if you could talk a little bit about um, the connection to Puerto Rico and the tr the relationship with Puerto, with Puerto Rico. Um, obviously, you know that was the number. Uh, the independence of Puerto Rico was the number one uh, point uh, in the Young Lords platform. But it's usually in the narrative is usually um, uh, it's also you know attributed as one of the failings. It's under the fall. It's usually. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk about that, about the role of Puerto Rico, about the role uh, <laughs> of the independence movement, and especially the activism in Puerto Rico, 
um, as um, as um, you know as as a failing or not um, as contributing to that to that decline of the young lords. Okay, who wants to tackle that? And uh, let's keep the answers brief if we can too. I know you have you have a good. I mean, I've I've heard your answer to this question, and I think it's a. a good um, the, the first point was uh, self-determination for Puerto Ricans in the United States and then the liberation of Puerto Rico. And I think that we um, were the ambivalent generation. You know, our, some of us, like Juan, had been born in Puerto Rico. Mickey, were you born here? And I was born here. Uh, but still, we grew up with our parents saying we're going back to Puerto Rico. Puerto, you know, uh, here was a temporary necessity. And uh, I think it reflected in our politics. So we understood and we still understand today that Puerto Ricans have a special role vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, stateside Puerto Ricans have a special vo uh, role vis-a-vis -vis Puerto Rico. Uh, Mickey mentioned uh, several of the political prisoners and, and the role, actually, that Puerto Ricans in the United States have helped with that, and Vieques, et cetera. What happens with the young lords and uh, at the end of 1970 is that the young lords say not just that we're going to support Puerto Rico in every way that we can, but that we're actually going to go to Puerto Rico and open up branches. And a theory uh, called the divided nation was developed, saying that we're one, we're really one nation, and so the young lord should be there and should be here. And it was an attractive theory f for everybody because we were all struggling with, um, we were not like every other immigrant that came to this country and got absorbed, for example. Uh, we had a connection. And, and, our, and our homeland was uh, uh, under U.S. imperialist control. So uh, it, it, was, it was a theory that could grab us. And also the understanding the struggle in Puerto Rico, uh, and particularly the nationalists, we used to call ourselves the children of the Nationalist Party and all of the, the um, killings, the imprisonment, so that was a, a history that was very close to the movement. And I, I mention that because although the Young Lords initiated that move, we had a lot of support for it. Inside the organization, there was some debate uh, about the move to Puerto Rico and whether we should have branches in Puerto Rico because the move to Puerto Rico was also accompanied by a restructuring of the organization in order to make Puerto Rico happen. And that restructuring actually, to me, is the first step in removing us from the community because the branch offices were now going to be committees to defend the community, but it wasn't clear who in the community was going to take charge of that. And the lords that had been assigned to the branch offices were sent to the national office, sent to Puerto Rico, were sent to do other work, and so all of a sudden, in the communities, the people said, what happened to the young lords? They've disappeared. In Puerto Rico, um, the, the part of the reason for going to Puerto Rico and setting up in Puerto Rico, and you read this in the internal documents of the organization, is that the, the, the Puerto Rico didn't have working class leadership to carry out a national liberation struggle. And so that the existing political parties in Puerto Rico were not up to the task. And so here the young lords want to come and save the day, All right? So it's funny today, but it was uh, acrimonious at the time. And uh, as a matter of fact, for me, that marks really the beginning. It's a, it's a period from which we could have recovered, but it begins the beginning to another change. Um, so for example, one of the, the most scandalous and disgraceful things that happened in that period was that people that raised questions about the move to Puerto Rico were called agents. And uh, 
you know, expelled from the organization and had their photographs on the front page. They were made pariahs. Um, and then that stifled, that goes back to my other point about the, um, the lack of openness in decision making, that stifled internally people wanting to raise because of people that were so knowledgeable and respected in the organization could be subjected to this, then that stifled and that had a chilling effect on other people raising questions. I see Huang's getting a little antsy because I'm taking too much time, but no, one, <laughs> I'm reading his body language. You know somebody for 40 years, you know, <laughs> or 45. <laughs> Longer, right, before the Young Lords. Um, but one other thing that happened then that when we got to Puerto Rico, we tried to adjust the politics to Puerto Rico. And for me, I don't think I've ever had this conversation with anybody here, but for me, one of the critical things that happened was that we created a hierarchy of what the priorities were in Puerto Rico that de-emphasized race and uh, gender equality. So that now, and this is common throughout history where when you have uh, uh, a national liberation struggle, women have to take the back seat. In this case, it was not just gender equality, but racial equality, because everybody knows there's no racism in Puerto Rico. <laughs> so that also then uh, sacrificed in order to become more attuned with the politics, with the perceived politics of Puerto Rico, those changes were made, and then th that affected the work that was happening in stateside. So, for example, in, in the documents, you know, I've, I've been spending a lot of time with documents, you can tell. Um, it says, young lords were instructed not to talk about sexism, not to use the word sexism. Uh, so that now we could talk about machismo and female passivity because, you know, those two things seem to be equal but you couldn't talk about sexism. So that the politics that was perceived as a politics that was good for Puerto Rico was then taken to the polit uh, politics here. So the whole Puerto Rico period is a very, it's a very emotional period because, you know, we, we can analyze it ideologically, Trotskyites and all of that, I don't go there. Um, because I don't think that that was necessarily that we weren't coming at it from that ideological perspective. But the dismantling of the organization begins then. Jose. Yeah, just an unsolicited uh, footnote. The Young Lords had an incredible, the Young Lords had an incredible impact on poets, writers, and artists, myself included. It wasn't just Pedro Pietri, who was, you know, the house poet or the people's poet. Uh, it was other poets, Lorraine Sutton, Elaine Romero, and I could go on and on, that, uh, and myself, that were influenced by the young lords, because they were not only grassroots, but when they went to the colleges, they also tapped into the talents and energy of artists. And as a result, the young lords helped to, uh, put some fire to the protesta movement. In the early stages of the 40s to the 60s, there was a movement called the neo rican N-E-O movement, not the New Yorican with the N-U-Y-O. That came in 1972 to 1980. So people get those two confused. And writers like uh, Pedro Juan Soto and so on, you know, were the pioneers for writers like Piri Thomas and, and of course the young uh, Victor Hernandez Cruz, one of the most prominent poets at the time. So I just want to give credit to the young lords because it was the young lords that took all these writers and what you coined Iris Morales as the rebel imagination. <coughs> and it was the young lords that inspired many of us to not just write, but to really actually write something that reflects the struggles of our community. That said, you took my question. How did sexism and chauvinism play a role in, in the, you know, the downsizing 
or the destruction of the young lords at the time. And what the women do it is to fight that sexism and chauvinism at the time. That's my question. Uh, Edis, you want to answer that? And also, Daryl Daryl has a whole chapter in his book on that, on uh, on the uh, uh, the uh, whole question of not only sexism but uh, also a gender identity uh, in the in, in terms of the young lords. Unfortunately, I haven't read Daryl's chapter, <laughs> so I don't know what he says. <laughs> but this is my take. Um, the Young Lords was filled with sexism and misogyny. But so was the society. It was a reflection of what was going on in society. So there's a, there's a book called Dear Sisters, which some of the feminists in the room might know, that documents how women were second class across the movement. So I, I want to highlight that because sometimes I think that uh, uh, the, the brothers in the Young Lords feel a little defensive as if they're being attacked and it's not an attack on them because this was the society that we were in. That's why there was a woman's movement because women were second class. So again, you have to look at the context and you also have to look at things in stages. There was the beginning period, there was a middle period, and there was a, a later period. In the, in the very early days, women were seen and not heard. Women were mindless bodies. Pablo writes about it. He says, the first time we heard about this woman's liberation stuff, we thought the women just needed a good, you know, he, this is what he writes. And faced with this situation, the women organized a woman's caucus. And it was a space for us to study. It was a, a space for us to create community the way that women do. And in the course of that, we came up with a list of demands. And, and um, I, I think it was 10, Denise, says maybe 10, you know, so more or less, and I've tried to count them up, and some of them overlap, but in any event, we put together a list and, and we had um, many things that we wanted to change. We wanted to change the fact that women were nowhere in, in any leadership or decision-making position. We wanted childcare because a number of the women in the organization had small children and they couldn't participate fully without childcare. Um, we wanted an end to machisto uh, uh, practices, uh, misogynist practices, where women were just viewed as sexual objects and the new recruits were like the latest person that you know men were looking to grab onto. I, I need some better language on this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of you will have some, some thoughts on that and give me some ideas. So, But any event, that was the early period. And um, when we raised this, it was not well received. We were accused of being divisive. And we were told, you know, we'll take care of this, you know, after the revolution comes. <laughs> and which was common, was a common response. And the, the sense of, of, of women raising gender uh, issues was also, as a, that was divisive, was also a common response. But in fact, women expanded the organization. Women brought in ideas about revolution, because how can you be a revolutionary and be oppressive? So women really brought in these ideas, and women also brought in other practices. The caucus, we later had a men's caucus, we had a gay caucus, the caucuses were disbanded, but nonetheless, we experimented with different things. Um, we were able to critique one another. Even the fights, I think, was a good thing, 
because we were we were arguing about ideas about human and personal transformation. And we believed both in personal transformation, I mean, we adopted the idea that was in the movement at the time of the personalist politicals, because a lot of people said, uh, 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 no, what's at home is private. And we said, no, the personal is political. So we went through that phase, and the young lords were extraordinary. There was a qualitative change in the organization by the end of 1970, where it was no longer accepted that women were not equal. I mean, it was, of course, women, you know, so we got women on the Central Committee. We had more articles in Palante. We had uh, the curriculum changed, the education curriculum changed. Uh, we got child care. We established the practice of child care throughout the movement. There were lots of gains that were made. And then we went to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I already told you that part of the story, so. Can, can I add uh, one small, one quick thing? Yeah, Daryl. Um, I think that w one thing that, uh, that Edie's left out that, that I think is, is really important about, uh, about what happened, at least how these challenges were advanced within the organization, um, is that this was a deeply intersectional analysis, right? That's, what the, that's the word we use today, which is just to say that, that this wasn't an analysis that isolated sexism as an independent thing, right? But rather look to the connections between sexism, racism, capitalism, colonialism, right? And brought those things together to develop what really what was, 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 and I think is still a really unique and powerful analysis um, of what, you know, of the problem with machismo, right? Uh, and the, when you look at like the position paper on women, which was the first kind of really, you know, good, detailed systematic statement, five pages long or so, published in Palante. Um, it's clear that that this that they're that they're making a unique argument, um, and they follow through with that in the pamphlet on ideology and in other writings that appear uh, in the Palante newspaper after that. And it's it's really it's it's if you haven't read the position paper on women, uh, go and read that. It's it's really a, a great document. I just want to I just want to add two things. I'm sorry on this point, and and Daryl reminded me. Um, I would be neglectful if I didn't mention how much influence the black feminists and the Chicana feminists had on, on the women and the young lords. Um, we met with black feminists. We met with Chicana feminists. Uh, we read what was available at the time. There had been a whole struggle before us about the women's liberation movement. We did not... Um, feel part of that movement, and so we were looking for our own guidance, and it wasn't called intersectionality, we called it triple oppression. Mm -hmm. We took what we learned in the, in the Women's Caucus, and we developed the Women's Union. And I just wanna read you two points on the uni, uh, Women's Union, which are two of my favorite, but it shows uh, some of the thinking uh, the, the farsightedness of the ideas. And remember, uh, as Mickey mentioned, we were like 2018 to 22 years old and we were grappling with these issues. So two of my favorite points which resonate today is we want the withdrawal of the American military force from our communities and an end to the sexual abuse of women. We want freedom for all political prisoners and prisoners of war, and an end to their sexual brutalization and torture enforced on sisters by prison officials. Free Lolita and Angela now. Okay. I think what we'd like to do is take one last question, and again, it's not gonna end. We're gonna have a reception afterwards. We'll be able to talk and, you know, and in, in more informal groups. We'll take one last question uh, right here. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Lora. Um, I'm from an organization in Harlem called the Brotherhood to the Soul. It's a youth development organization that is, uh, with its youth work, is very closely modeled and, and studied after 
uh, the work and the legacy of the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, and revolutionary organizations alike. Um, I just want to ask if anyone could speak a little more, highlight the the youth engagement aspect of the Young Lords Party. I know that you've done a lot of work with free breakfast programs and get you know do, doing that for for younger kids to get them ready for school. Um, in terms of adolescents, high schoolers, because I know, as uh, I believe you mentioned earlier, it was uh, that 19 to 21, 22-year-old range of uh, Young Lords members. But in terms of high school age, those that adolescent range, any, any kind of youth engagement done in, from that regard? Uh, my recollection was that um, they were Young Lords. I mean, we had people that, um, that either left their house or uh, people that were in high school. I think Ramon was in high school. He would go to high school during the day. Ramon Morales, right? He would go to high school during the day, and then in the evening or in the afternoons, he would come to the office. People that left their, their, their homes, they're 14, 15, 16 years old, um, used to live in the Bronx branch. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think that there was a specific... We, we did have a, a Puerto Rican Student Union, which was a college organizing organization. I don't remember. And we had the Third World Student the League, third world which, student was, a high school, high school, right. which yeah. was a high school organization right. in all the high schools. We were pulling From kids out school. of high school all the time, you know, <laughs> strikes. <laughs> that, was, that was the thing to do. You know, the third world, that was the job of the Third World Student League. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was a youth organization. I mean, Juan Fee Ortiz, who was on our central committee, was 15 when he was on our central committee, right? And he was in charge of the finances. He had. <laughs> <laughs> And, and we didn't have bank accounts, <laughs> so, so Fee was always walking around with a wad of cash, right? Uh, and uh, he was in charge of our finances when he was 15 or 16 years old. Uh, and uh, so it was a youth organization in that sense in terms of, in, you know, the direct involvement. Thank you. Can I say something about that? Sure. Um, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the Young Lords is that the Young Lords was the high school and the university for young people of this generation. And I've, I've um, interviewed many Young Lords, both in Chicago and New York, I mean, probably 100 by now. And all of them are the most articulate, um, serious, committed, people who have such a profound and deep analysis of the world then and the world today. And that is inspiring to me because I grew up in the public schools of New York and I too had to find education elsewhere, even outside of the university because I felt alienated in the university. And here you had an organization that inspired young people to be the best people they could be and to educate themselves in order to transform society. I mean, it, it's a really incredible thing that uh, the statistic then was that 70% of Latino students dropped out of high school. That's a 70%. And the Young Lords offered an incredible um, alternative uh, that gave young people a better education than they would have, than they could ever dream of. All right, well, I, I'm going to close this just with uh, I'm going to give you a, uh, something I've never let out. But you know, I told you about 25 years ago I tried to start writing my own uh, draft on the on the Young Lords. It never went anywhere. Uh, hasn't, to, but I still have a copy of some of that initial draft, and I just want to read to you a little bit of a, the, uh, a few graphs of one section that I had um, on the the disintegration of the organization. By mid 1974, the remnants of PRO, the Puerto Rican Revolutionary Workers Organization, became even more rapidly sectarian. Expulsions of members as opportunists and agents of the bourgeoisie became more frequent. Soon physical attacks and torture against some of the top leaders began from a warm and creative organization espousing a new humane form of socialism and revolution. The group turned into its opposite, 
a nearly fascist-like doctrinaire sect which sought to stamp out all opposition. How does something like that happen? It is easy to blame one individual or the loss of one leader or one policy change or one incident, immaturity or government repression. Real life is much more complicated. In that process of self-destruction, many of us played a part from the very beginning in our style of work that formed the basis for our later degeneration. And all the while, we were being confronted with arrests and beatings of our members, as well as COINTELPRO dirty tricks, which reached a high point during the Nixon administration. We were relatively young and immature. Our success with the mass media made us arrogant, made us believe we were indestructible. Even in our most disastrous efforts, though, we grew and matured. At the Puerto Rican Day Parade in 1971, we wrongly tried to seize the front of the parade away from the police department. Police wantonly attacked our group and scores of people were injured. Thousands of, of Puerto Rican parade go goers blamed the young lords for the incident. We learned the dangers of left extremism. The expansion to Puerto Rico in 1971 confronted all of Puerto Rican society with the question of whether U.S. raised Puerto Ricans were genuinely part of the Puerto Rican nation. The formation of various mass organizations, such as the Women's Union, the Workers' Federation, the Committees in Defense of the Community, began experimental forms of organizing in our community. Uh, the efforts to build workers' collectives in major factories in the United States and Detroit and Chicago and New York gave many of us direct knowledge of factory life. Uh, the coordination of a major November 4th coalition that brought 7,000 people to Washington against the Vietnam War during Nixon's second inauguration in 1973 sharpened our organizing skills. There is much more to the YOP history. The expansion to Puerto Rico alone is worth a small book in anecdotes and lessons, as is the experience in organizing workers from Gouverneur and Lincoln Hospital with HRUM to Levitan Electrical in Brooklyn to L.W. Foster Sportswear in Philadelphia, and there were the successful campaigns to free political prisoners, Martin Gonzalez Sostre, Pancho Cruz, Carlos Feliciano, and the Nationalists. Uh, there were incredible experiences of some leaders in jail on trips to China and Cuba uh, around the United States. Even in those periods when we made our worst mistakes, none ever doubted the commitment, determination, of, or ability of our members. The personal sacrifices, tragedies, and histories of some of the major participants are themselves small epics waiting to be written. And we're going to have another one soon <laughs> from Edie, so you, you, can, you know that's going to be an epic <laughs> when that comes out. So, uh, so um, I want to thank you all for coming to this first uh, uh, in our series of public conversations and hope you'll come back with some of the others. And we're going to have a reception outside. You'll be able to talk with everyone. And I think Johanna has some copies of her book on, the, uh, on, uh, uh, on Mamiya uh, that, that's available if anyone wants to buy one and have her sign it. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much.